Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about The Mandalorian Season 3. First, it's been a long time since I did, did a podcast. Maybe that's a podcast in itself. Uh, it's been about two months. All I'll say is to a special someone, I love you and I miss you. But getting into this is a little strange for me. I because of what was going on in my life and the two months I took off and the apartment and things, I rushed into a bunch of stuff to get my Halloween fix. And in that horror type of stint, I started watching some of the shows that I missed. Now, I went to go back and I watched some of season one. I didn't get through season two. But from the beginning, The Mandalorian has been a charming, fun ride. I think the quality diminished. Again, I didn't watch season two fully, but I'm going to. But right from the beginning, there's something wrong with it. You can watch enough videos and people doing reviews on it that get really in the, you know, do deep dives on it. But there's little things that don't add up with sets and storyline, the, the length of the show. And there are some great elements. But I'll say season one is my favorite season three and two are probably like the same they're okay they're not my favorites again season two i'm, I'm definitely going to go back on it but i didn't like some of the things going into weaving into it and then i remember the boba book of boba and getting ready to watch ahsoka i had an excitement built up and Going into Season 3, I was a little bit surprised that they were going to, or turning it into, um, basically a Bo-Katan storyline, which is great. I love Katie Sackhoff. I love her to death. She's amazing. She's great in the, in the show. And I was just a little surprised, because I remember the Book of Boba Fett, when it got to, like, Episode 5... <laughs> It turned into the Mandalorian season 2.5, and you find out about Yoda, uh, ba and I'm oh, sorry, Grogu and Luke, and I was shocked. I didn't get that level of shock in this, but I was waiting for it to go into a more Western thing again, and I think that's what they prepped for season four. So. I'll hold back on that critique, even if it's just a nitpick. But again, I'm going through season three. I'm a little surprised that it's a Bo-Katan-centric story. And as it progressed, I started noticing my interest waning a little bit here and there. But again, it has enough charm. It's not a bad show. Is it the best season? No. Can it be a launching point for a... It getting back to the height of the first season, yes, because I'll, I'll get to that when we when I eventually get through some of the episodes. Just a little bit of a um, preamble here, but it's been a while since I got back, and this was just my first. Well, I'm going to do a bunch of them and then put them out, but so this might be something I you may hear on a couple of these uh, new podcasts that I put out. But again, I'm excited for it. I was getting into it. I was a little distracted from the horror, and I didn't get to do my one one per day horror movie thing, but I got enough in, and I'm going to do some podcasts on those movies. But I got a enough of the Grogu fix and some of the cute elements. The again, the Bo Katan story, I kind of really enjoyed, but I was getting a little surprised at how many Mandalorians were left. But you got to take into account that they're trying to rally, even if there is, let's say, for the benefit of doubt, two factions, right? There's the ones that don't take off the helmet, and there's the Bo-Katan's former crew. So you can at least say there's two, and they're both recruiting. There's some great elements mixed in here. But again, the flaws that show for me as a viewer are like the same ones with Obi-Wan. My desire is to love it. I love Hugh McGregor. He knocked it out of the park, Hayden Christensen. And I'll get into Ahsoka too eventually, but 
I am a nerd at heart. I want to love these things, but there's this little part of me that knows that um, the thing I saw, I'm going to have to uh, critique it in a sense, but it shouldn't ruin people's enjoyment of the show. And I'll say that right now. I think it's a good show and people are loving it. So I have no qualms about uh, arguing with somebody like the Justice League movie or Snyder's fucking Batman, Superman fucking movie, like things like that. That uh, Or even, uh, dare I say, the Batman that just came out, the, the classic now. Was it fucking, uh, it's my fucking most watched video. But anyway, so I'm going to say it's going along and people are liking it. It's, I think it really needs to up its time. A lot of these shows, what happened to the days of Buffy doing 22 episodes? You know what? If three of them aren't that great, it gives people flexibility to expand and try new things. But you've got a solid season of 18 to 20 pretty good and amazing episodes. So you're doing like eight or nine and they're like 30 minutes. Like It just boggles my mind sometimes. Now, Andor is another one I'll get to eventually. 12 episodes. Not a lot of action. And I think there's a balance between drawing out something to make it tighter, meaning you want to keep two elements in the show, write it out, and kind of stretch it out to make it fill in a nice chunk, like a, a two-part movie, where something with a little less um, action and stuff, or lightsabers and force powers, like Andor, is going to take the three-episode arc things and worked on it. I think it did it great, but I'll get to that another time. But when we start off the show with the uh, Mandalorian and the ceremony, I, I don't mind the, the monster type thing and, you know, going on the, the quest, which is what eventually happens when he decides to redeem himself because he admits to taking off his mask. So he finds out that he's got to bathe in the pools of Mandalore. I'm not exactly sure. It's a ceremony. And I guess people in this group have uh, in the past done this. But because Mandalore is destroyed or rumored to be poisoned and you know leveled, the Emperor took his vengeance out on them. It's a hellhole, so no one goes there. But the Jaren decides he's got to do it. He'll redeem himself, and he like he goes to revive a droid, the uh, IG. But that the whole thing kind of fizzles out in a couple episodes, or this episode, this episode itself, when he doesn't settle for it, and it's just a foreshadowing of the future. In a way, and it comes back, I guess you could say in a good way. But he goes through this thing to get this droid, and he winds up not getting the droid he wants, and he gets a different droid, but it's the R5, and it's on wheels. I thought he needed something to go spelunking, and anyway, it's good enough to do what he needs to do. And he decides, oh, well, before that, it's a whole little thing with, you know, he's got to get a memory chip for IG, and it's a special one. And I thought that was kind of woven in. Okay, smart, but I was a little confused as to when he started going after this pool or going to look for it. I was kind of lost in like where that story was going, but that's okay. You're getting into it. You're going into episode two, and um, like you said, he gets the R uh, five, and I'm still like, okay, he's gonna go um try to see if the air is clean and if he can survive on it, which. I'm not sure why that was a concern when they have sealed helmets, but I guess there's a limit to everything, just like their fuel for their rockets. So he goes to Bo-Katan for her help. She's like in a castle. And you see right away it's starting to... And I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with saying Bo-Katan is a veteran, much more skilled, obviously more skilled with the Darksaber. But let's say she's a prodigy on her own. She's got history, and she outclasses Dijon. Makes like a, a, a big mistake here, and it kind of feels a little forced. 
So, right, there's this, he's, they get to Mandalore, and she won't help him, she doesn't go. bo stays at her castle, and he gets into trouble, and gets attacked by a cyborg. It's like a creature, multi-leg, anyway, it incapacitates him and keeps him sedated, and like a little droid creature pops off from it, and... Okay, so he gets taken and he's captured. And they make a couple of real important decisions here, and they call back to it later with him getting disarmed, and he sends the droid. Good to go back for bo and get help. So, droid goes back, comes back with bo -Katan. She helps him, frees him, and they're able to bathe in the pools of um, the living waters. Again, you, you see in the beginning stirrings of it, and I, in my brain, I kind of I registered it, and it has to do with the dog saber, obviously, but that'll come later. And they, you know, they bathe into the well, he, fucking Dijon nearly dies because he steps into the pool, and uh, because of bombing, it, it opened up the chasm underneath it, so he falls and nearly dies. She has to go in and save him, so aha, she's also bathed in the waters, and on her way up, she sees a mythical creature, the mythosaur, and that kind of goes nowhere except for a story element that gets added. So, I'm kind of on board, but I can see where it's going with bo and she doesn't like tell him about the mythosaur, I think she only wants to tell us the armorer eventually. But again, you, you, you completed your mission, you barely survived, you, you know, bo helps you and you go back and you're going to, oh, you got to have proof, so he takes a little bit of liquid, and when he goes back, he's immediately like, you know, hey, you're exile or something, and okay, I get it. Um, but again, it's not showing a real villain yet, and... Cut to, like, the um, science officer that was trying to do the cloning. And there's a whole episode with him of the, um, going through this thing and they're trying to see if he's a reformed or not. And he's, he is. It just, it's a weird jarring out of the episodes. I'm wondering... Obviously, it's calling back to the end when you find out about um, like the real villain eventually, but this whole episode, I don't know, you know, uh, trying to get him to uh, agree to continue his cloning research, and it's a setup, and the girl sets him up, and she's frying his brain, is some kind of thing, but it doesn't feel like it pays off enough, even when you find out that the ma uh, the guy comes back eventually, whatever his fucking name is. Um, I don't know, Moff Gideon. Again, here is where I'm like a little lost, like I was with the, or shocked with the Bo uh, Book of Boba, where it's all of a sudden Mandalorian. But here it's the Mandalorian with Bo Katan, and they're cutting to this whole episode of the former guy who you kind of lost track of through all these shows. He's so far back, and then when you bring him back, and you're not in the thick of it already, meaning it's not like he's doing cloning research and stuff, it's more like, oh, I'm reformed, and they convince him to continue his cloning research, because it's for the betterment, and I didn't kind of like the way that went. Again, if it was in the thick of it, and you find out why he is now not reformed, I could kind of feel, you know... A little more propelled by it, but you get bogged down and you, you, you're breaking him in a way and he finally does it, he gets caught and, you know, it just draws myself from when Dijon and uh, Bo-Katan go back and they get, you know, called exiles, whatever, and not supposed to be in there and he proves that he's fucking got proof, he bathes and he also gets bo -Katan to be redeemed also, because she hasn't taken off her helmet since she saved them. 
and again, you start to see the elements of where the show is going and highlighting bo -Katan. And I'm okay with that. But it's, it's pretty evident. And I could see people who are like reviewing the show a little bit uh, unnerved by it, in a sense. You know, it's the, it's the main... But I'm, I was okay with it. It was the episode before that kind of, you know... It, it just kind of... So, you know, just kind of sit well with me, and then I'm trying to get back into it now. I think they go into the combat training, and again, you, there's the charm is here, and uh, they form a new piece of armor for Grogu. Yeah, it, it's just a little more opening for his past. You, you kind of got a cool scene um, with flashbacks with Grogu. And I think at this point, like, I was still, like, still going, what, what's going on, like, with the other, you know, people? And then, of course, there's a fucking problem when the kid gets captured, and bo has got to be the one who comes up with the plan. She seems to got the, all her wits about her, and it goes, it's noticed by people, so eventually she's gaining, you know, their trust, and they, they saved the boy. And there was a little thing here about the, um... The rockets and how much fuel they have. I thought it was funny. But, okay. And like I said, the Jedi Temple thing with the flashback and seeing, um, you know, a little more for his escape was okay. It just felt a little misplaced in that I, I didn't feel it was almost necessary. Although I feel, I felt like they were trying to lead up to him starting to talk. So maybe this is part of it. I don't know. Um, you know, then you're getting into, um, Carl Weathers, a grief cargo, and trying to get help with the New Republic, and it kind of fits in. I like going back and, you know, seeing things, and I think bo actually talks to, uh, the armor about the Mythosaur, and it, she said it's like an omen. Yeah, I, I think it starts here where... Again, I start getting a little confused. I know there's more than one faction, and the whole thing with the helmets is important, but the armor tells bo to take the helmet off, and she walks both worlds. And again, they, they, they showed they were going to make it a bo centric thing, and I'm okay with that, even to the catering of other characters with her. And at least they showed her worth in certain circumstances. So it's not one of those tell and not show. So I'm grateful for that. But you can tell it's where it's gearing towards. Um, and there's the illusions that uh, Moff Gideon escaped. He wasn't taken uh, to prison. It was That was a little thing they went in before. Uh, you know. Then they got to fucking get bo former army because... She can bridge the both worlds. And this is a pretty cool fight, but she's got to take her old number one, or whatever the fuck you want to call him. Like his name is Axe, I think. <laughs> and this is a pretty good fight. And it shows again, Bogotan's clearly um, a veteran of the stuff, and especially with Mandalorian gear. They're a little more re realistic, uh, you know, especially when you have people in Beskar armor and stuff. and using the jetpacks in a cool way, and even throughout the episodes, um, little touches of things really show um, that bo are, you know, as good as supposedly she, they say, say she is, or th what they're trying to imply, because eventually it gets revealed um, that I think... Um, is it the armor? I think I think it's the armor. It's like you know you're gonna be the one who uh, um, unifies Mandalore, and they're gonna retake it type thing. I'm not sure if that's hinted throughout the episodes, but again, you can feel it coming on. Uh, like I said, from catering to her and just kind of gearing towards her, and again. You see where it's going, and you're watching it. She does the thing with acts and. They do the callback for the dark saber, and I don't know if it's a if I liked it. I guess it made sense. Like if I was a dungeon master, 
and someone tried to do this in my group, I might have to acquiesce because what he, uh, Mando or Dejan doesn't want to fight her. Now, let's say he can win or not. I don't know. He doesn't want to fight her so she can win and get the, the dog saver because that's how you get it. But he says, and it's the truth, he went on a mission. He got beat up, captured. His weapons were taken from him. Bo Katan had to come save him and kill the entity, creature, person who defeated him. And she used, now he didn't say all this, but when they showed it, she, he was incapacitated. She used the dog saver uh, with so much more finesse and skill. And she handed it back to him. So it is at least there. I'm going to give the show credit for that. But can I go now and watch reviews and stuff and people don't like that? I will understand it. So she's here and then he says, and the John's like, isn't it true that she's the rightful owner? And they all had to kind of like nod their heads. And again, it's like one of those things would happen on a, in a Dungeon Dragons game. And you might have to give him because technically they're right. If it's not in the heart of the thing. Um, but at this point, you know, Moff Gideon and, uh, you know, he's got his counsel and he's trying to get what he wants and he gets what he wants. I think they fucking did a Hawks guy and might have recast him or something, but uh, Project Necromancer. I mean, I, I, all right, so skipping ahead to some things. I know Thrawn is back and or Thrawn is here in live action and stuff, but are they really going to try to creep right up to the First Order shit? Because I fucking hate those sequels and I'm trying to get those out of my head and these are wor it's working. Because I'll get into my reviews and I'll do Ahsoka and Andor. I've watched them already. This thing goes the way Moff Gideon wants. He gets this thing and there's a couple of little, little secret plot things in there which are fine. And it comes to a head again. You know where it's going. You saw bo get the dog saber. She's got everything lined up for her. Even the Mandalorian and the way he talks her even says something like, you know, that's why I follow you and I would follow you. That type of thing. So I'm okay with that. But when you get to the end, I think it was a letdown. I'm not saying you, uh, spoilers or whatever, that you shouldn't have destroyed a certain item that signifies the, the man, like those things, but... I wanted to see her, because she looked way more skilled in another, I did the Mission Impossible like thing last, and there were some fight scenes where actors just didn't look like they could fight and were just way too choreographed. It almost seems like there's a problem here with that, where she should have had the upper hand at points, but Muff Gideon's in a super armor, powered armor type thing, and they're making sure you hear the sound effects, and it's fun. You're getting into it, again, not as epic and as satisfying as the other seasons. But you've got some great clashes here, special effects, opticals, whatever you want to call them. Just really, really fun fights. Rocket packs, jet packs, aerial battles. Again, you can nitpick with some shorter people. Like, there are flaws in a lot of these episodes that will stand out for people like looking for them. And I'm sure they're valid. But by this point, you're watching this huge battle and you're having fun. You got to smile and little things will go by you here and there. And I think the only time I started getting jawed a little bit is when Grogu did his thing. Because another callback is the IG droid and he's riding it like a mech. And he's sitting in it doing things. I kind of was thought I would like it, but I didn't. And then they show the, um, you know, it wasn't a secret because he said it, but the, what is it, the, uh, the emperor's personal god, Praetorian gods or whatever. And this battles that uh, amp up and actually are really good to, uh, to a certain extent. I think Ahsoka really upped the ante on certain battles, but again, I'll get to that. And so here, you know, I'm coming towards the end of this season. I've noticed this thing with bo and when it hit here, I thought it didn't pay off enough. I think if you're going to go that full tilt, you might as well make it more epic in, in, in that favor. 
I'm not saying um, this is when they decided to make the Mandalorian stand out on his own, Dejarn, but him and Grogu with the fight, uh, Grogu's um, kind of re reawakening. He can hit the button now and say no, 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 yet. And it was kind of a way for him to talk. And they go back with the... I like seeing Carl Weathers and, you know, Creed, whatever the fuck his name is, and Navarro. And they were promised land and things are paid off. And I guess you can say Mandalore is now retaken by Mandalore. And I'm also... I didn't do a deep dive, but there's something about being born on your Mandalorian and if you're a foundling and stuff and how their ancestors did it. So there's a, a through line about the cultures of the Mandalore in here. And I thought that was pretty good. So uh, on the whole, I'm going to say, you know, I had fun watching it. I'm not sitting here I'm really pissed at the downfall of the Mandalorian. But I'm not here hyped for season four. And I think that's an issue. Especially since I've watched Ahsoka. I've watched uh, Andor. Well, Andor, I guess you can put out of your mind because of the time reference. So it's still, you know, years before the Death Star. Whatever, I gotta steal the planes in the movie. So I guess you can take that out. But, you know, Book of Boba, now Ahsoka, and where that left things off. You know, I hear they're doing a movie. I've been so out of it that I can't even um, make a solid, you know, educated guess at where I think they're going to go with this. Because if they decide to slip in Mandalorian Season 4 first, or are they going to go with Ahsoka Season 2 or the movie? Or are they even going to bring the Book of Boba Fett back? I don't think they will. I think they're going to use them properly, hopefully. And you use Boba and his assassin, or some actress from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Ming something, use them sparingly. Um, you still got the, who what was it, a outtake on, or ending scene? You got the uh, Timothy Oliphant was in a back to tank. You can use him, but use him sparingly. Bring back Bill, Bill Burr. His character was fucking him, the best scene in maybe all of Star Wars. So, again, I'm coming off season one. I watched a little bit of season two, but it was more fresher in my mind, so I kind of know where that ended. I think the Darksaber-type Mandalore heritage thing was done okay. Putting Boba Bo-Katan in the forefront was done, was done, again, okay, but I can sit there in the back of my mind and hear people complaining, especially when certain flaws of this show show up. I remember what, when I watched Obi-Wan, I was having a good time, but I kept saying to myself, why the fuck doesn't he know that Vader is alive and that it's Anakin? Why does he need Reva? Why'd they have to give that to Reva? I thought it was dumb, stupid, and it plagued me for the whole thing. And maybe it didn't deter my you know, initial, uh, final uh, enjoyment of the show, because that show is fucked up. It has such fucking stupid shit in it that I would actually put certain shows ahead of it in quality. Although, you know, Obi-Wan's like one of my favorite characters in Star Wars. Fucking not using Qui-Gon when he's stuck with the rocks was like a crime. A anyway. But as you're ramping up with these shows and you're watching the beginning and you're getting to the middle and to the end, Mandalorian always felt special in the way it compartmentalized its priorities of it's a Western... Going from town to town, uh-oh, he's got a kid now. He's got to take care of the kid, find it a home. That doesn't work out. And again, you're piecing this together from the Book of Boba because you find out he went to go back and get Grogu in the Book of Boba season. I think that's a big mistake looking back at it now. Because going back and retracing your steps... Where does it end, season two? It's Grogu staying with Luke. But you know what? And they could have made a decision right there to just do a season of Western-like episodes without Grogu and just kept pushing back the major issues of the universe-type problems and kept them peppered in 
Like, some shows do really well. And then you could have had it going on. Like, I don't know what their plans are, because it, it now feels like there's a change of God, there's a priority shift with, like, Thrawn and Ahsoka. Because a lot of things, like, won't add up for me with this. If we're talking about how long is it after the Battle of Yap, and, like, how many students has Luke got as he built the temple? Are we really going to measure up? To, are we going to see Ben fucking solo as a kid? Like, I'm getting fucking angry just thinking about it. So are they rushing things to a point? Can you say there was a major incident that involved the Mandalorian, Luke, Boba, um, Thrawn, right? Because he'll be the stopgap measure between... What happens in this universe, timeline, era, and why the First Order took took up, why they were able to take over. So, I can see that actually, you know, coming to fruition, but, you know, you get a little confused because you see um, Mon Martha in one show, she's in the other show, but the other show is earlier, and a newer show, you're wondering why she isn't you know, given the authority, and I'm talking about Ahsoka. Like, are they blend all these things into one? Because they have the one character who kind of is in a bunch of them, the pilot, Carlson or something. And he's, like, in the fucking courtroom, and he's bringing up things that happen on Mandalore. Because he's, like, you know, the one character that jumps around. You know, I start worrying a little. Well, I worry from episode one, even with the Mandalorian. Because as fun as I had, I... 30, 30 minute episodes, some less, some more. And this problem goes on with Ahsoka. Not so much with some, you know, maybe other ones, but it happens. And you're wondering where the fucking show is ending off and where it's continuing. I'm going to say I'm not super excited, but I'm, I'm not ill and fucking pissed like I was watching the sequel movies, which I still fucking hate. And I'm actually starting to hate Force Awakens now. Just thinking about it. But I still kind of give that a pass. I don't know what I'll put out next in what order. But I did watch all the Star Wars shows. Except for the animated ones. Like I never caught up on Bad Bunch or Apprentice and things. I think there are a bunch of other things. I might start you know, putting it a little bit at, under my belt just to get it out of the way. Because the Ahsoka thing kind of interests me. Because I've watched all the Clone Wars. And I didn't finish Rebels, but I'm going to finish that. Uh, I can't say the sequels, the fuck up of the sequels is gone totally, but The Mandalorian, at least it's a little bit more consistent, but it, it's definitely a downgrade in quality from season one, two, and three. Could it be showrunners kind of moving around, shifting things? That could be possible. You know, I usually call out things, but... I think most of this was the same with who's running it. I guess you can get into the episodes, the writing, because writing is super important. Right? It's always going to be one of those things. John Favreau, how many was he on? You know, is their attention split? You know. So we'll see. But I came away from this uh, more enjoying it than, you know, being annoyed if any was it Dave Filoni too might get involved. Yeah, he was involved in some of these episodes. But I still think it's quality in the sense of not as horrible as the sequels. It feels like there's love being put involved. There's a little bit of, you know, lore and there's a little bit more understanding of things. But again, that understanding just makes some of the nitpick jarring things kind of blare out more. Like it just you did something so well but i'm gonna say it's better than worse it's got me interested but not super excited um liking the elements just maybe you know the priority of the episodes and where they were going this seemed like it had to be written this way to make room for what's next because you can definitely see at the end of this um Mando and Grogu are on the farm. They they got some land, and they're taking a break. But I think the armor says something like, "Because uh, he has to adopt him." He, uh, Mando has to adopt Grogu as his child, 
in order for him to get the foundling thing. And Yarmor says something like, well, now you got to take him on adventures. And I guess that means for the Mandalorian going on bounties, right? Or is it? Does the show shift to him, you know, only going after certain people and changing his modus operandi type thing? You're going to have to get a different ship. And that was one of the hints when they got the Naboo fucking Starfighter thing. It was like, you don't have your setup no more. You can't have, which is kind of weird to begin with, like five carbon carbonite fucking things hanging and a chamber that's like, that must have been so expensively set up. Because I don't even think, well, I guess you could say Boba's is like that. But anyway, I came out of this happier, you know, than sad. Uh, again, confused, scratched my head here and there. But I was in a rush of getting through things. I will definitely double back, finish season two, and watch this again. I'm not into Star Wars and Star Trek, and I did those also, so I'll talk about those. In any case, um, it's good to be back. I hope everybody's doing well. My best to you and yours, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.